All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am recording this lecture, and if you haven't noticed, I've already posted the previous lectures. Uh, if you haven't found them, check out our Canvas website. Uh, we do have a full complement of lectures on the website at this point, uh, including today's lecture, which will be posted after today's class. Um, today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to start our section on the cardiovascular uh, module. So um, this is one of my favorite sections. I think for anyone that's interested in the healthcare field, whether that's vet school or med school, PA school, nutrition, um, this is very relevant, applicable to these healthcare professions. So I think that you'll really enjoy it. Um, you'll learn a lot uh, about what uh, is done in the clinics. So with that, um, I do have a few top hat questions this morning if you want to get your devices out, just a couple of them. Let's start off with a review to get us back in the swing of things. All right, so pretty easy question, I think, up front. Uh, which type of muscle is striated and possesses gap junctions? Is it A, skeletal muscle, B, cardiac muscle, C, smooth muscle single unit, or D, I forgot the H, smoot muscle, uh, multi-unit. <laughs> that should be smooth muscle, multi-unit. So which type of muscle is striated and possesses gap junctions? <coughs> We'll have one more question after this. All right, we're already up to about 74 students, 76. I'll give you about 10 more seconds here. Again, don't worry, we have another question coming up. So we're at 79 students right now. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this particular question. And the correct response is B, cardiac. OK, good job. All right, so the first part, let's just talk about this for a minute. I just want to review, because we had a few people that said skeletal muscle. Um, yes, uh, if you identified that skeletal muscle and cardiac cardiac muscle are striated, you would be right. So you could eliminate smooth muscle because smooth muscle is not striated. It's not organized in sarcomeres. So immediately you could eliminate C and D. But which of the muscles possesses gap junctions? That would be cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscles have these gap junctions to ensure that the depolarization waves go from cell to cell to cell so that you get a coordinated contraction of cardiac muscle. You want your heart to beat in a coordinated fashion. All right, so I'm not going to elaborate on that yet. Let's go to this next question. What proteins are expressed in the intercalated discs of cardiac muscle? Is that A, desmosomes, B, ion channels, C, gap junctions, or D, all of the above? So this is something that we will be talking about in the future too, so don't worry if you're a little confused. We've only really talked about intercalated discs very briefly, and we talked about one of those proteins that are expressed in the intercalated discs. Oh, 
All right, we're doing pretty well. We're all already up to about 70 students. Okay, we're up to 80. I'm gonna give you about 10 more seconds. I wanna make sure that everybody in this room had a chance to answer. Okay, this is the one we'll take for points. We're up to 90 students. All right, anybody in this room need a little more time? Raise your hand high if you're still struggling with getting your answer in, maybe some connection issues. I'll peek around the column here. All right. So with that, I will close this one. And like all multiple choice questions, a lot of times the response is all of the above. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this for just a second. Um, the intercalated discs actually connect the muscle fibers. And I'll show you a movie uh, once we get down the road on uh, how the heart works, specifically the heart as a pump. These fibers are very long strands that wrap around the heart. And they're divided or connected, I should say, by these gap uh, intercalated discs. And the intercalated discs, they're containing those gap junctions. So uh, for those that actually answered gap junctions, yes, that's absolutely right. You might have taken the lab uh, and talked a little bit about uh, gap junctions. Um, but when we talked about cardiac muscle and intercalated discs, but they also express ion channels and desmosomes, right? It really does connect those uh, muscle fibers. Uh, and, and those fibers actually wrap around the, um, the the heart muscle itself, the heart as the, an organ, and when it uh, contracts, it kind of um, decreases the volume within the ventricles. And I'll show you an animation again when we get to heart as a pump and, and talk more about these intercalated discs and how the, the cardiac muscle is arranged. But it, it's true, all of these different proteins are expressed within those intercalated discs. And remember, one of the most important is the gap junctions, allowing for that depolarization wave to go from cell to cell to cell before contraction. All right, so let's go ahead. Now, um, if you have your muscular calculation sheet that I handed out on Monday, Go ahead and get that out. If you don't have it, I have a few extras here if you want to come on up. Yes. There you go, sure. There you go. Yes. Whoops. There you go. Here you go. Three? Sure. Sure. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good. All right. Uh, I got a couple of them there. Yes. There you guys go. Give. You guys need three more? Okay, two more. Two more or three more? Two more. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> All right. I only have a few left here. Oh, great. Uh, yes, I think that that's it. All right. All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's go ahead and start out with concepts in cardiovascular lecture. Now, I mentioned this um, last time. Let's go back to Ohm's Law. I know, I see all the eye rolls already. Um, okay, so Ohm's Law states that the driving force is equal to flow times resistance. And now what we're talking about is flow and resistance and driving force in hydraulic terms. Okay, so I want you to think about um, garden hose physiology. You can see that the driving force is missing in this box. Uh, what is the driving force for the movement of blood through the vasculature? What is propelling that blood through the vasculature? Does anybody remember this chart and how to think about that? We talked about it too when we talked about garden hoses. What do you think? Yes. Yes, exactly. It's the pressure difference or the pressure gradient, right? So this is what we're talking about. The pressure gradient should be the driving force. 
So, like water in a garden hose, blood is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, right? So the driving force is the pressure gradient. Now in this case, instead of current, the flow of blood is going to be a unit of volume, either milliliters or liters, per a unit of time, per minute or per second. So flow is equal to, you can see the chart here, mils or liters per minute. All right? And then resistance is going to be dependent on the viscosity of the blood, the vessel radius, and that speaks to the smooth muscles that we were talking about last time, right? If the smooth muscle contracts and the radius decreases, it's going to change the res resistance. It's going to increase resistance. If the smooth muscle relaxes and those, the vessel radius increases, it's going to lower the resistance. Also, vessel length is important in resistance. The longer the length, the higher the resistance. So we'll talk more about that when they, we get to the vasculature. But let me go to the document camera. And I want to make sure that we all remember Ohm's Law, right? So Ohm's Law states that the driving force and I can use DF as driving force, is equal to flow times resistance. Okay, so I'm going to write this another way, and this is how we're going to use it. All right, the driving force when we're talking about the entire vasculature, is going to be the mean arterial pressure. That's the pressure in the arteries minus the venous pressure. And that's the pressure in the veins. Right? That's our pressure difference. Mean arterial pressure minus venous pressure in the heart is going to be equal to cardiac output in mils per minute. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So CO is cardiac output. And that's essentially the flow through the vasculature, mils per minute. And we multiply that by total peripheral resistance. Total peripheral resistance. And I'll show you how to calculate in that in just a bit. Now what's interesting about this equation, Ohm's Law, is that venous pressure is usually zero. Venous pressure is usually zero. So we can, we can take that out of the equation. Unless there is something unusual, there's some kind of pathophysiological state where the venous pressure is higher. But under normal conditions, venous pressure is zero. So we can actually express Ohm's law as mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. All right, so let me show you a few things on how you can use this equation, how you can calculate mean arterial pressure, and how you can ca calculate cardiac output. And if you know those two terms, you can just rearrange the equation to figure out total peripheral resistance. And after I show you this, I'm going to let you go and actually do some of the problem set here, uh, maybe one through three, 
so that it really solidifies this concept. Okay, so how do you calculate mean arterial pressure? I'm just gonna use another sheet here. It's like I'm writing on the board. All right, so mean arterial pressure can be calculated using a few terms that I know you have intuition about. All right, you need to know something about these terms, systole, systole and diastole. Systole is describing an event during the cardiac cycle where the heart is completely contracted. All right, the heart's completely contracted and the volume in the ventricles are at their lowest. Okay. Diastole is when the heart is completely relaxed and the volume in the heart is the highest. The volume in the ventricles are the highest. So this is systole is when the heart is contracted. Diastole is when the heart is relaxed. So you all have had your blood pressure taken, right? You've all used what's known as a sphygmomanometer. Whenever you see manometer, M-A-N-O, that's a measure of pressure. So that's a fancy word, Svigmo manometer, for blood pressure cuff, okay, blood pressure cuff. And when you actually, what you're doing is you're putting the cuff on your forearm, or your uh, biceps and triceps, and that is actually measuring the pressure in your brachial artery, okay? So it's kind of an indirect uh, measure of systole in the heart and diastole. And you all have actually, let's just say 120 over 80. That's pretty normal for an individual, 120 over 80. That's your blood pressure. Again, it's measuring the pressure in the brachial artery. And indirectly, it's measuring the pressure when the heart is completely contracted and when the heart is completely relaxed. So the top number is the systolic pressure. And the bottom number is the diastolic pressure. Systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. All right, you might not know this, but when we say 120 over 80, the units are actually millimeters of mercury, which is a unit of pressure. It's 120 millimeters of mercury over 80 millimeters of mercury. Okay. All right, so how do we calculate mean arterial pressure? Mean arterial pressure at rest, let's make sure we know that it's at rest, is equal to one-third of the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure plus the diastolic pressure. <coughs> All right, so using that equation, you all can work in groups. Why don't you just try um, the first question? The first question on your essential cardiovascular calculations. This states, I'll just put it right here, mean arterial pressure is not the simple average of systolic and diastolic pressures, why not? How is mean arterial pressure estimated from the information given in the table above? Hi. Yes, um, hold on just a second, this is my last one, yep. Um, from the uh, table above, calculate the mean arterial pressure in this case. How does it change with exercise? And don't Google it, use your intuition to actually try to answer that question. All right.
All right, how many of you need a little more time? Okay, I'll give you a few more minutes here and we'll do this together. All right, I'm gonna use the document camera here. <coughs> All right, so how will we calculate this? Remember mean arterial pressure is equal to one third. And what we have here is the systolic pressure is, well, let me, well, no, we'll just go through it, 124 millimeters of mercury minus 82 millimeters of mercury plus 82 <coughs> millimeters of mercury. So I don't have my calculator on me. What is the answer? 96. That's about right. That is right. All right, so why do we use one-third? Why do we use one-third when we're calculating mean arterial pressure? Do you all have a discussion about that? What did you decide on? Why would that be the case? I was eavesdropping. I don't mean to put you all on the spot. <laughs> um, sorry, but not sorry. <laughs> do you do you want to talk about it? Sure. Okay. I was thinking that um, our hearts are in the like diastolic state more often when it's completely contracted. So That's. I was saying like think about your heartbeat, like listening to the rhythm of it. Right. That's absolutely right. Okay. Absolutely right. Okay. So what she was saying is that when you think about the cardiac cycle and your heart beating, your heart at rest is in diastole longer than it is in systole. That's absolutely right. And that's why you calculate it using the one-third value at rest. So what do you think is going to happen when you exercise? When you exercise, it's gonna be about 50-50. So, just so you know, when you exercise, this value is going to change to one half. And your mean arterial pressure is gonna go up slightly if the values are the same. They're not gonna be the same, right? Because you know when you exercise, your heart rate goes way up and your blood pressure goes up as well. All right. Do you all feel pretty good about that? And can you answer question number one? Pretty good? All right. So let's go on. Let's, uh, let me show you how to calculate cardiac output. All right. Cardiac output in mils per minute happens to equal stroke volume, which is going to have units of mils per beat. Bear with me, mils per beat. <coughs> Times heart rate, heart rate in beats per minute. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected when the heart is completely contracted. So I'll say that one more time. This is called stroke volume. And this is the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart when the heart is completely contracted. 
stroke volume. And then you all know heart rate beats per minute. Okay, so you can see here that beats are going to, can be eliminated. We can cancel that out. And cardiac output is going to have units of mils per minute. And that's a flow, flow. So one more thing, how do we calculate stroke volume, which is, and then we can calculate that as a percentage called ejection fraction. All right, so if you imagine the ventricles, that's where the heart is being ejected from. We'll learn about the chambers here today too. Um, the ventricles, stroke volume can be calculated using the end diastolic volume, right? You know diastole, so this would be the volume of blood in the ventricles when it's completely uh, relaxed. End diastolic volume. That's going to be the amount or the volume of blood in the ventricles when they're completely relaxed, minus the end systolic volume. Oops, sorry, systolic. That's gonna be the amount of blood that's left in the ventricles when the heart is completely contracted. So the stroke volume is gonna be the amount that's ejected. Does that make sense? End diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. So let's talk about number two. Calculate the stroke volume cardiac output, and ejection fraction. So let's go back. Ejection fraction is just going to be stroke volume over end diastolic volume. Oh, yep, yeah, there you go. Stroke, so this is, let me just make sure you know these terms, ejection fraction is equal to stroke volume over end diastolic volume. All right, do you wanna try number two then? Why don't you work at, uh, in groups? Let's do number two together in just a little bit. Yeah, question. Since we don't know anything about the heart waves yet and the R to R value, let's just uh, make sure that the heart rate is 75 beats per minute.
So heart rate is 75 beats per minute. All right, how many of you need a little more time? A little more time? Okay. All right, what do you think? What is the stroke volume for this? What is the stroke volume? You can raise your hand. What do you think the stroke volume is? Yeah. It's 70 milliliters, right? Okay, so stroke volume is going to be end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. That's going to be 140 mils minus 70, right? You see that in the table. So stroke volume, that's the amount of blood that's ejected, is going to be 70, oops, not millivolts, milliliters. All right, what is the ejection fraction then? What is the ejection fraction? Yep, 70 over 140, right? Ejection fraction is going to be 70 mils over 140. And that's going to be 50%. The answer would be 0 0.5 or 50%. Now normally, ejection fraction is about 55%. Just so you know. Ejection fraction is usually about 55%. All right, the last one is cardiac output. What is cardiac output? What did you get for cardiac output? You can raise your hand. I don't have a calculator. Yes. What's that? 805? Five thousand two hundred and fifty, right? Five thousand two hundred and fifty. So that's going to be seventy mils. Uh, let's see here. Stroke volume is seventy mils per beat 
multiply that by 75 beats per minute. And that's going to be 5,250 mils per minute or 5.25 liters per minute, right? Yes, question. Mm, why sometimes are the units for stroke volume um, just milliliters and sometimes milliliters per uh, okay, so with stroke volume, it really is milliliters per beat. Okay. Yeah. So um, I should have probably put that up here, milliliters per beat. It just gives you more information. Okay. That's going to be the amount of blood that's ejected with one heartbeat. Yes. So then for the ejection fraction, would it be 70 milliliters over by 140 What would Right, right. So ejection fraction, let's just, is just a percentage. Okay. Yeah, it's just a percentage of the amount of blood that's ejected. Yes? Um, I see it all the time expressed as both. So just be prepared, yeah, if it's mils, it's going to be about 5,000. Uh, that's very normal. Uh, and remember, there's a huge range and variety with different individuals. So when I say normal, I'm probably talking about between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, okay? Um, I shouldn't use the word normal, but that's kind of where people fall within that range, okay? About 5,000 mils or 5 liters is cardiac output. And remember, that's a flow. So think about all the blood flowing through your entire vasculature system. All right. All right. Let's finish this up. I just want to do the last one here. Just so you know where we're going with all this. It's a lot of mathematics. I'm glad everyone has a chance to kind of roll these numbers around. If mean arterial pressure, let's go to the document camera one more time. If mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance, if I give you the systolic and diastolic pressures, and I tell you it's at rest, you should be able to calculate mean arterial pressure. If I give you stroke volume and heart rate, you should be able to calculate cardiac output. If you know these two terms, you can just rearrange this Ohm's law statement, this equation, so that mean arterial pressure over cardiac output is equal to total peripheral resistance. Does that make sense to everyone? It's just a simple algebraic equation here. That's how you would calculate question number three. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You can see that total peripheral resistance would change when you increase heart rate, stroke volume, right? Uh, diastolic pressures, systolic pressures. Anytime you're actually manipulating these variables, you're going to have a change in resistance. Yes. All right, great question. All right, so we're going to leave it there. I'll let you mull around with these um, essential cardiovascular questions um, at home as well. We'll continue on. Um, this isn't actually due until next Friday after we get through the vasculature section. So you have some time to kind of work on it, take a look at it. Um, all right, so let's continue on with this. This is just an introduction. We have about 10 more minutes here. I want to get through um, just some basics in, in uh, circulation or the circulatory system in general. Animals across the board have different circulatory systems. Um, there's a few main components here. Three main components of any circulatory system 
are some kind of pump or propulsive structure that establishes that uh, pressure gradient, a system of tubes, channels, or spaces, and absolutely fluid that circulates through the system. So circulatory systems move fluids by increasing the pressure of the fluid in one part of the body, and the fluid flows through the body down its resulting pressure gradient. So you have to have these three components, a pump, a system of tubes, and fluid. All right, so you don't really need um, hemoglobin, which is interesting, right? Other animals have something called hemocyanin. So it's not, it, depending on the animal or the species of the animal, right, that isn't one of the three main components. These are the three main components of pump, tubes, and fluid. All right. So also, you may not know this, but some of the pumps may vary. Uh, even your skeletal muscle, particularly in your uh, legs, um, help to return blood to the heart. Your respiratory muscles, when you breathe in and out, helps to return blood back to your heart. Um, you have one-way valves to ensure that the fluid is moving in a one-way direction. Some animals actually have pulsating blood vessels, like peristalsis. Uh, they have auxiliary hearts. But for us, we're going to be concentrating as humans um, chambered hearts. Atria are actually reservoirs, and ventricles are the pumps. Okay, We have four chambered hearts. We have two atria and two ventricles. And again, those uh, valves within the vasculature help to ensure unidirectional flow. Um, here's just, if you're taking zoology or you're familiar with some of the zoological concepts, this are the, these are the major phyla within the animal kingdom. And you can see there's a variety of different circulatory systems. Uh, we're going to be concentrating mainly on uh, mammalian uh, uh, physiology, but you can actually see, I would say, one of the classic examples are arthropods and mollusks that actually have what's called open circulatory systems, meaning uh, they, some of the blood, or I'm sorry, not blood, but hemolymph, some of the liquid, the fluid, actually enters into open cavities. So let's take a look at that. Here's a good example of an arthropod and some of its components of a circulatory system. Uh, it does have these hearts and auxiliary hearts. These are pumping structures that create those pressure gradients. And then you can see some of the fluid with each pump actually does enter into, you can see at the end of this tube here, into open cavities. So this is known as an open circulatory system. And then it's drawn back in by, again, pressure gradients into these openings called ostia. Ostia. So again, it has pumping structures, tubes, and fluid. The fluid in this case is called hemolymph. Hemolymph. And the cavity in an open circulatory system is called a hemoseal. <coughs> so this is all part of an open circulatory system. The fluid is called hemolymph. And the cavity, that open cavity, is called a hemoseal. All right, so going back here. All right, so this is a comparative look, a comparative look at fish, amphibians, and on the far right-hand side, mammals. And you can see the evolution. Uh, these are kind of giving you an idea of how um, Basically, the circulatory systems have evolved differently. With the fish, we only have one atria and one ventricle. 
So essentially what we're looking at is a two-chambered heart. And you can see all of the blood within the heart are deoxygenated blood. So blood is returned to the heart. It's deoxygenated. The deoxygenated blood is then pumped into the gills where it's oxygenated, and then there's enough of a pressure gradient to keep the blood moving to the various tissues and organs. Okay, now let's take a look at the fish heart here. I think we're running out of time. Um, the fish heart actually has, whoops, this sinus venosus, you can see here. This is where the pacemaker cells are. Just like our hearts, remember these are myogenic muscle. So these hearts can actually contract spontaneously because of those pacemaker cells. And in the fish, it's no different. The pacemaker cells are in the sinus venosa, causes the atrium to contract first, then the ventricle, and then the blood is pushed through the chorus arteriosus, or also known as the bulbous ar arteriosus. So this is actually how it is more organized. This is just a diagram. You can see the sinus venosus and the reservoir, the atrium. The ventricle is actually very spongy. You don't have any coronary arteries, so it keeps this area fairly um, alive. Uh, there's enough oxygen. When, when I say deoxygenated blood, it's not completely devoid of oxygen. It's just depleted by about 25%. So there's enough oxygen that and spongy uh, tissue here that allows it to be oxygenated enough so those cells stay alive. All right, amphibian heart, this is where I will leave off. We got one more um, slide here and then I'll concentrate on the mammalian heart next time. With this, you can actually see amphibian hearts actually have three chambers. They have two atria, a right and left atria, and one large ventricle. Now, supposedly, these little knobs called tribeculi, uh, they help to separate the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, but I can imagine when that contracts, there's a lot of mixing that goes on. Okay, so going back to this figure right here, that's why in the ventricles it's kind of purple, right? You get mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, remember that frogs and salamanders, those kind of animals, they also uh, receive a lot of oxygen from their skin, not just from blood that is propelled into the lungs and back. So that mixing reduces the amount of oxygen, but again, they have other ways of uh, gathering oxygen to help with their survival. All right, so next time we're gonna concentrate on the mammalian heart. If you wanna look it over, this is a four-chambered heart. We'll pick this up on Friday. Uh, have a good Thursday. I will see you on Friday morning, everyone. Hi. Hi. I might take Sam on paper. Yeah. Um, when are we supposed to get those back? Did you take it with the class? Yeah. Okay. Oh, get it back. You got your yeah. score. No, okay. no, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Score. I was gonna say, oh my god. No, no. Okay, yes. Um, I am. Let me think about that for Friday. Okay. Um, I do want to hand them back. I do want to have you all have a chance to actually look at the answers. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that I don't usually hand back the exams when the questions aren't out there. So I'm trying to figure out the best way to okay. kind of show it to you, let you see what you did wrong, but yeah. then not. Okay. And since people talk, took the um, the proctorio and some people took the paper exam, yeah. I might have to just go through it in class. Okay. That means you won't see your paper exam. Hi, Nigna. How are you? You won't see that paper exam. Okay. Yeah. So That's fine. Yeah, I was just I'm going to figure out the best way. Okay. And you can good. always, always come into my office and we can go yeah, through it together. Yeah, maybe I'll just do that. Yeah. That okay. sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Would you have any of our homeworks with you? I know Nigna said that maybe you had actions. I did, but I didn't That's bring okay. them with me. Oh, but I'll fine. bring them on Friday for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I just thought another question up here. Is there a way to access the top Yes. So usually, like last time, I opened them up for review. Okay. Um, if you want me to open them up for review, maybe just go ahead and definitely do that. All right.
the ones that we keep. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just have a quick uh, question. So uh, I know the exam is October 28th. Yep. I just want you to know before. Yes. Um, so um, I ha do have a class after, so I would okay. I would take it in the same day. Okay. But I was just wondering if, uh, like, I can take it in your office yeah. or should I take it in the DRC? Uh, my office is just fine. Okay. We can figure out Perfect. something that day, too. All right. Yeah. Okay. That Thank sounds you. great. Thanks. Hi. Hi. So, um, oh, you like the... Whatever the yeah, one, my number four. Yeah, thank yes. you. Um, we put it in, like we email them to you. Yes. Like, okay, you didn't get a score. Right. Okay, that's so my fault. Confused. I might just send it to Magna and have yeah. to enter all of them. Perfect. Thanks for reminding mm -hmm. me. Yeah, that's okay, fine. That Thanks. Is. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, we we all have the same question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we all have three exams. Final oh. exams on the day of this class is final. Oh, final exams. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So on December fourteenth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I running. always have an alternate, always. Okay. Okay. So you have two opportunities to take the final. Uh, it depends on how we're going. If we're on schedule, then the last day of class is when you have the first opportunity to take the final. Um, sometimes that doesn't work out, obviously. Sure. So uh, it's usually um, not on the study day, but then the first op op uh, opportunity right after that. Okay. So when it gets closer to that time, you will always know that December 14th is available to you, but there will always be a second opportunity. Okay. So um, and it'll be before. Yeah, probably. Well, so um, there isn't one after. We could. It, the 14th is what Saturday. a Saturday. Saturday, and that's yeah. like the second day of finals. Yeah, right, like right, right. First. Because yeah. Thursday and Friday are a study day. I think so. Okay, I yeah. So. Then I will do it the next week. It'll probably right. either be Monday or Tuesday of the okay. next week. Okay, okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, you. yeah. You're welcome. Thank you.